My name is John Lanzma. I'm the Gerald F. Hawthorne Chair of New Testament Greek and Exegesis at Wheaton College. Dr. John Lanzma. John, good to see you again here on Exegetically Speaking. It's always good to be back, always. Nice to talk to you, David. Yeah, always good to see you as well, and I look forward to maybe sharing a meal or seeing you face-to-face in the not-too-distant future. Uh, You've been on a number of times before, and we can make reference to that in some of the show notes, but today we have have, uh, a listener who would has asked a very good question. He lives in New Zealand, the other side of the world, and uh, he may be our, our most distant uh, listener. I don't know. But anyway, tell us a little bit about Russell and his question today. Yeah, Russell wrote the question that uh, he said, I have been told by a specialist in Greek that the relative pronoun in Matthew's genealogy of Christ, this is Matthew 1, uh, in the pronoun form, there is haste, haste. He's been told by a specialist that that's only feminine. Now, he cites an example of that out of Matthew 1, 3 in his email, but the word that he actually highlights is an article. But in verse 16, that pronoun form, haste, does occur. Uh, Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, out of whom, ex haste, haste is the pronoun, mm. was begotten Jesus, uh, who is called Christ. Uh, So to repeat, Russell was told by a Greek specialist that the pronoun in Matthew's genealogy is, quote, only, only feminine, unquote. So Russell then consulted a concordance where that same form of that pronoun occurs, haste, a feminine genitive singular relative pronoun. And he found translations like the day in which he was taken up in, in Acts 1 or the apostleship from which Judas turned aside, Mm -hmm. or the covenant which God made. And all of those in Greek use that same feminine genitive singular relative pronoun, haste. Now, the point I imagine for Russell is that in English, the words day and apostleship and covenant don't sound feminine. So it would seem as if the Greek pronoun that refers to these words, the word haste, must not be, quote, only feminine, unquote, as the as the Greek specialist had said. So Russell goes on to ask, could someone please let me know if this specialist advice is true or is it more nuanced? Hmm. Okay, so that's the question. Now it's a great question too. <laughs> it's a good question. Yeah. And when my when my daughter was was very young, she's married now with her own child, but when she was very young, she complained that dad, that is I would give mile-long answers when she believed that it needed no more than a foot or a yard or even an inch. <laughs> uh, and you're about to find out how justified she, she was. Uh-huh. So first, first, and that's a dangerous word because there's always a second and third, but first, Greek is a more inflected language than English, for example. In English, we know which word is the subject of a verb and which word is the object, mainly by word order. Tom hit the ball or the ball hit Tom, and the words ball and Tom are the same, but word order tells us which is doing what. Uh, Greek relies much more on inflection, that is, on what's called case endings of nouns, pronouns, and so forth. So Greek nouns, articles, adjectives, including participles and pronouns, all have case endings, different endings uh, of each word that show gender, number, and case. Now, Russell's asking about the gender of relative pronouns, but in our illustrations, we're going to broaden it just a bit to talk about gender of any of these parts of speech, any of them that use case endings. Secondly, then, gender is only grammatical. Now, I'm exaggerating that for a point. Because the word cosmos, that we translate world, the word cosmos was masculine, or the word gay for earth was feminine, or pneuma for spirit was neuter in Greek, didn't mean that a language user was thinking of those things as male, female, or unsexed, or impersonal. Uh, It's just a grammatical form. Mm -hmm. Now, 
Are there exceptions to that claim that grammatical gender is just grammatical? Yes. Uh, by analogy, philologists such as Tolkien or C.S. Lewis may choose to use a word with reference to some archaic or etymological sense that no everyday user of the language would know of or use, and that's fine. But if they, that is if Tolkien or Lewis, do that, they almost always have to explain themselves because most people probably don't think of All Saints Day when they speak of Halloween candy or they don't think of a Roman Catholic mass when they speak of Christmas sales and stores and they don't mentally connect the word church back to the Greek term uh, kuriakos, from which many think it derives. Kuriakos means belonging to the Lord or Lords. So also with Greek gender. The first century Jewish philosopher Philo of Alexandria could, on occasion, cash in the grammatical gender of a word to spin one of his allegorical interpretations. So, uh, for example, he's talking about Bethuel, the father of Rebecca, and he equates Bethuel with wisdom, the Greek word Sophia, which is feminine. And he uh, etymolo etymologizes and gets daughter of God for Bethuel. But then he goes on and asks, how can someone who is feminine, Sophia, wisdom, Bethuel, and daughter of God be a father of somebody? And uh, with a high view of inspiration, he thinks nothing is accidental. So he asks, is it because the name indeed, the name indeed of wisdom, the grammatical form is feminine, but the sex masculine, for indeed all the virtues bear the names of women, but have the powers and actions of full grown men. And he goes on from that. And the only point that we're interested in is that in that allegorical interpretation, he pays specific attention to the grammatical form and he activates it, he operationalizes it. But those are exceptions. Beyond the obvious correlation of grammatical gender with natural gender, so that words like woman in Greek are grammatically feminine and words like son are grammatically masculine, it's unlikely in the extreme that when Paul wanted to add an article or an adjective to the masculine noun cosmos, for example, world, he thought consciously about the word being masculine as if that was somehow semantically important. He just made the words agree in gender, just like you and I would make sure of subject verb agreement as a matter of correct grammar. Uh, it's just a grammatical reflex and probably more unconscious than conscious for a natural speaker. So first, Greek is a highly inflected language, including specifying the gender of nouns, articles, adjectives, pronouns, and so forth. And second, gender is mostly a purely grammatical matter. Now then thirdly, does inflection of gender add precision to Greek? Yes, sometimes, maybe not. Uh, let's <laughs> consider a few examples, and a couple of these will be adjectives, not pronouns, but it helps make the point. So Matthew 6, 13, deliver us, this is the Lord's Prayer, deliver us from evil, apa tu pane ru. That's an adjective. The adjective can be masculine, feminine, or neuter. It happens to have a form where the genders overlap in form. Mm -hmm. So it could be translated as neuter from evil or it could be translated as masculine from the evil one, i.e. Satan. And you see interpreters uh, debate that kind of thing. Or again, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, where Paul kicks off his whole discussion of the body and, and prophecy and tongues and the rest. And he introduces the whole thing with the phrase periton pneumaticon, kind of literally concerning the spiritual fill in the blank. Uh, spiritual is an adjective, and at this point, that own ending, the maticone, could be any of the three genders, either most viably, either masculine or neuter. So, again, commentators debate, is he saying concerning the spiritual things or gifts, or is it masculine concerning the spiritual people, the spiritual ones? Or it could be both. He left it open on, on purpose. Mm. Or to, sh to shift gears. Over in Hebrews 11.4, you get this sentence. By faith, Abel offered a better sacrifice than Cain. He offered to God a better sacrifice through which, now this uses the very pronoun that Russell was asking about, that very feminine form, haste, mm. through which he was attested to be righteous. It's feminine, 
but there's two feminine words in the preceding sentence that it could have as its antecedent, either faith or the offering through which he was attested as righteous. Either one of those could be defended on purely grammatical grounds. Hmm. And you get the same thing in Hebrews 11, 7. By faith, when he was warned, Noah, that is warned concerning the things not yet seen, acting reverentially, he built a kiboton, a, a, a kibotana, an ark, unto salvation, so rian, of his house, through which, again, that same pronoun, haste, through which he condemned the world. Now you have three candidates, <laughs> through which could be faith, it could be the ark, which is feminine, or it could be salvation, the salvation he effected for his house. And it's not that all of those are ultimately exegetically equal uh, in viability, but grammatically, any one of those three could be the antecedent mm-hmm. of that of that pronoun haste. Or again, Ephesians 2.8, familiar passage, by grace you are saved, you have been saved through faith, and this not out of yourselves, it is gift of God. And when the English says, and this, because English doesn't inflect, we kind of naturally take it to refer to the most current, the most recent word, which is faith. So it sounds in English as if he's saying you're saved through faith, and this, faith, is not of yourselves. And he goes on, but in Greek, that pronoun is neuter, whereas both grace and faith are feminine. So in the strict grammatical sense, neither is the antecedent, but he probably uses the neuter because he's referring to the entire event as a, as a whole package. This whole thing is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Or again, different illustration, Hebrews 11.32. This is in that great catalog of heroes of faith. Mm-hmm. He's winding things up and he says, and what shall I say? For time fails me relating concerning Gideon, Barak, Samson, and he goes on from there. Now, we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews because the person doesn't name herself or himself. The only concrete clue we get is from this participle here, where he says, for time fails me, that's a pronoun, relating, that's a participle, that is narrating, relating, that's a participle, it modifies me, and it's masculine. So everything else being equal, we assume self-referential participle, masculine gender, probably the author is a male. Although I'm going to quickly, and I won't go into this, but admit that it could still be Priscilla. She may have, <laughs> she may have just been deferring to conventions and using the masculine as a default. Uh-huh. But everything else being equal, it's masculine, it's self-referential, so we would assume it's a male. One more illustration, Second John 1. Uh, the letter begins, the elder, as the writer of the letter, to the elect, the chosen lady, and to her children, whom I love in the truth. Whom in English can be singular. So the sense could be the elect lady, whom I love. Whom in English could be plural. Her children, whom I love. Now the Greek pronoun whom is actually plural. But it's also masculine, which agrees neither with lady, which is feminine, nor children, which is neuter. So probably what happened is his mind went from strict grammar to just the sense of the thing. He was thinking of both of them. The gender inclusive sense is usually conveyed in Greek by the masculine, especially masculine plural. So he slides off of strict grammar to use a masculine plural pronoun in Greek that says whom I love in the the truth to refer to all of them. Now, to return to Russell's Greek specialist, Mm. who said that the pronoun, the relative pronoun in Matthew's genealogy is, quote, only feminine, unquote. If this specialist meant that the form of the relative pronoun that occurs in verse 16, that word haste, is feminine and only feminine in that form, then yes. But that does not mean that the relative pronoun as a word is only feminine. The gender of the case form of the relative pronoun is going to depend on the gender of the pronoun's antecedent, except sometimes when it doesn't. (laughs) And as importantly as anything, one cannot rely on an English translation as a guide to what's going on in the Greek. 
And that's just one more reason why the knowledge of Greek, not just the knowledge of bits and pieces and access to parsing software, but reading knowledge of Greek and Hebrew and Latin must be preserved in the present and coming generations. Please support this work for the sake of the gospel and the church and the world. It's, it's, it's work to acquire it, that knowledge, but it really matters. Yeah. And I'll get off my soapbox. Hey, listen, that was fantastic. <laughs> I, I even learned a few things, uh, you know, thinking about that. But uh, students that I've had over the years often confuse natural gender with grammatical gender. And yeah. it takes a little bit of a learning curve to figure that part out, doesn't it? It does. And you get thrown in both directions. So when when students are first learning the personal pronouns and they see a feminine personal pronoun and they automatically want to translate it as her but in that greek sentence it might refer to what in english is a thing the church or something else mm -hmm. a and table. you have to learn to <laughs> right. yeah you have to it, learn to translate it as it right you know? yeah exactly dr john lasma uh, as always great to see you you're our wheaton based director of exegetically speaking so good to see you and we look forward to seeing you soon thanks for all you do david if you learn too much today and your head is hurting, there is one sure cure. That is to share this podcast with a friend. If you've never visited Wheaton College, I hope you'll make plans to do so. We have a wonderful campus all year round. And if biblical languages are your fancy, check out the MA and the BA program at Wheaton College. You can go to wheaton.edu, look for modern and classical languages, get started today. This is the day you want to do it, right? If you have questions or comments, if you just want to be in touch, please email us at exegetically.speaking at wheaton.edu. That's exegetically.speaking at wheaton.edu. Thanks to all those who make this podcast possible. You know who you are. Until next time, thanks for listening.